Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Welcome to another session of economy this week wherein we are going to cover all the important economy related articles which have appeared from 10th of December to 23rd December 2022. Now before we start with the first article, wish you a very happy new year and before we go on with the discussion, here is a gentle reminder to all of you. Make sure that you have subscribed to Baiju's exam prep IAS YouTube channel and you also join the telegram channel of the Baiju's exam prep IAS. The link for the telegram is provided. Please do join, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that whenever the videos are put up live because in this year we have planned various initiatives, live initiatives for your benefit. So please do hit the subscribe button as well as the bell icon so that you get these initiatives. Now with this caveat, let's start the discussion. The first very important article, SEBI continues the ban on agriculture derivatives. Now what is this idea of a SEBI banning agriculture derivatives and how it is relevant for the UPC examination? That is the most important point you need to understand here. First and foremost, Derivative is basically an instrument. Instruments are nothing but the ones which are traded in the market. For example, you must have heard of shares, you must have heard of bonds. These are nothing but instruments in the market. In the same way, there is a derivative instrument. And the term derivative, what does it simply mean? Derivatives generally derive their value from an underlying asset. Simple. Derivatives, for example, if I show you a piece of paper and if I say this is a derivative, this piece of paper individually doesn't have any value. But this piece of paper will derive its value from some asset such as gold, such as currencies, such as agriculture, commodities, etc. And because the piece of paper that I'm basically showing you derives its value from some other underlying asset, these are called as derivatives. Now there are different types of derivatives. Be focused on the agriculture future contracts or future derivatives. The reason why SEBI has decided to continue with the ban on agriculture derivatives is simple. Earlier there was a supply of certain agriculture commodities in the market and as a result of which that is causing inflation. Now many of you will be confused as to how these derivatives are causing a shortage of supply or are adding to the inflationary trend in the market. Here is the sequence, simply understand the sequence here. Imagine there is agriculture derivative that is a future contract of certain agriculture commodities such as rice or wheat. Now if you are basically trying to enter into these futures, what you generally see is what is the supply of these commodities in the future? What will be the demand for these commodities in the future? And based on that, you enter into these derivative contracts. And the beauty of these derivative contracts, that is the futures is that once you sign this futures, there is an obligation on the buyer to purchase the commodity and the seller to sell the commodity on the fixed price when the contract was actually signed. Now follow the sequence here. Imagine you are basically a derivative trader as per your analysis and based on the trend. There is an expectation that in the coming days there will be a shortage of supply of certain agriculture commodity. And because the analysis or the trend shows that there is going to be a shortage, what generally happens is there is a lot of information that is added to the derivative market and the prices of the derivatives are determined based on that. That is you enter into a futures contract based on what the trend is actually showing. In the recent times the price of rice has increased, price of wheat has actually increased and it is expected if allowed it is expected that the price on which these derivatives will be entered into would also be very higher. Now when these derivative prices are set at a higher level there is one more person in the market who will look at the derivatives and will realize that the market is expecting based on the trend the market expects that there will be a shortage in the future 
and what might happen is that the second person will look at this market trend will start storing a lot of these agriculture commodities and as a result of which supply of the agriculture commodities to the market will go down and when supply will start going down the market prices will automatically start going upwards and that will contribute to inflationary trend in the market now all of this will happen understand this all of this sequence will take place when you allow the derivatives in the agriculture commodities to be traded in the market what if sebi says we will not allow the agriculture derivative market itself that is no contracts or no futures will be allowed to be entered into using these or based on these agriculture commodities as assets underlying assets and if these derivatives are not entered into this will not send a signal to the intermediaries to start storing more and more which will contribute to inflationary trend in the market and that is the precise reason why sebi earlier had banned the trading of agriculture derivatives and now has announced that it will continue with the ban on these agriculture derivatives but what is the issue here apart from the inflationary trend and the sequence that we have discussed is there any angle attached to this particular article please understand this the derivative market is very important in determining the trends of supply and demand in the future if you are a food processing company based on the derivative market which is giving a signal to you you can decide to import certain commodities you can decide to purchase commodities agriculture commodities to be converted into processed foods in the future and you can enter into these particular futures in order to ensure that you will have a safe or let's say the constant supply and a disturbed supply of the agriculture commodities on a future date now because sebi has imposed a ban and has continued with the ban all of these issues will be cropping up so these are certain very important point regarding the first article here now based on this i've given an mcq consider the following regarding derivatives all the derivatives are regulated by sebi statement is wrong many of you basically look at it and say sir but just now you discussed an article where sebi has banned agriculture derivatives now you are saying sebi doesn't regulate the derivatives because please understand this there are different types of derivatives futures options right swaps etc there are different types of derivatives some of them will come under the regulation of sebi and some of them such as interest rate swaps or currency derivatives will come under the regulation of reserve bank of india and that's a precise reason i say that first statement is wrong futures options are types of derivatives simple straight forward factual statement statement 2 is correct so right option for the question will be option b only 2 is correct let me go to the next article here imf has approved 3 billion support deal to egypt now first and foremost imf is one of the bretton woods twin institutions imf generally provides lot of assistance to those countries which are facing certain structural issues or let's say certain issues related to balance of payments the best example in recent times where imf has provided assistance is to sri lanka and now imf has approved 3 billion dollar support deal to egypt now this article has certain important points please have a look at these points first one the deal that i'm talking about is basically a type of a deal called as extended fund facility extended fund facility eff now what are the important points here generally generally please make a note of this generally extended fund facility is provided for a duration of 3 years but can be extended beyond 3 years as well for example in this particular case it is beyond 3 years so it's not just fixed only at 3 years it can be extended second whenever imf will provide assistance it could be a conditional assistance or it could be condition unconditional assistance what is the basic idea here conditional means imf will provide the assistance to you such as extended fund facility 
but will attach conditions which the member country has to implement or IMF will give certain reforms or areas in which reforms have to be implemented and the member country has to implement those reforms. Whereas unconditional simply means the assistance will be provided, no conditions are attached to the assistance. Now what sort of the funding is extended fund facility, it is a conditional assistance. That is the second very important point. Third very important point. The IMF has decided to provide this assistance not in a lump sum amount and generally does not provide a lump sum amount like this. What they provide is you achieve these reforms or implement these measures and as a result of which we will keep on releasing certain funds. And as a result of these kind of conditions please understand this with immediate effect that is uh, once the deal has been signed the country of Egypt will be able to get access to 347 million dollars. Now when I say dollars here, I have a very simple question to you people. What is this idea of a STR, special drawing rights? What is this idea of a STR? Some of you might be thinking sir, you are talking about dollars here, why are you asking about STR? Very simple reason for that. Most other times, whenever IMF will provide assistance IMF will collect funds from the member countries, IMF will borrow from the member countries etc, etc, etc. The conversion is generally provided in the form of ESTR. So what is this ESTR? Is it a currency? Is it a fiat money? What is the right answer? Please give your answer in the comment section below. Now let me continue. Now first point that we have discussed is IMF has decided to provide uh, extended fund facility to a member country that is Egypt and with immediate effect 347 million dollars will be available to Egypt and over a period of time as the conditions are met the funds will be released by IMF. Now apart from this, this deal that has been signed between IMF and Egypt has been signed after Egypt has implemented certain reforms such as hike in the interest rates in the last year. So generally what you see is IMF will provide assistance either for very very short duration or to a much longer duration that is let us say 3 years, 4 years and the repayment conditions are attached and the member countries will have to meet these particular conditions in order to get access to funds and the extended fund facility is such type of facility where the IMF will provide this assistance to address certain structural issues in the balance of payment. And that is the precise reason that duration for such fund facility or such a deal is not very very short duration. It is generally around 3 years extendable up to 4 years. So these are certain very very important points regarding IMF providing assistance to Egypt. Now based on this I have given a question here. Consider the following regarding extended fund facility. It is a concessional type of lending. Concessional means the rate of interest is very, very low, right? Very, very low rate of interest. Non-concessional means, right? The member country will have to pay a higher rate of interest. Statement is wrong. It is a non-concessional type of lending. That is the rate of interest is higher. Under it, Financing is provided for a period of up to 3 years only. Underline the term only. Statement 2 is also wrong. It is extendable. So right option for this question will be option D neither 1 nor 2. Next very important article. SEBI very recently has announced that it will be phasing away share buybacks through stock exchanges. Now, what is this share buybacks and why is SEBI? trying to phase it away and is there any committee associated with this, we will understand these points. First and foremost, I am pretty sure you have heard of Paytm company, TCS company, right or let us say Infosys company, Zomato etc. Specifically in the context of companies issuing the shares in the market or selling the shares in the market. That is in the last couple of years, number of companies in India such as Paytm 
Zomato have gone through IPO, initial public offering, wherein they have issued shares which can be traded in the stock market. Now imagine here is a company EX, it has undergone IPO, FPO, etc. And the shares of the company EX are available for trading purposes in the market. Now whenever this company X will decide to purchase these shares back, simple, what do you mean by share buyback? Company X has gone through IPO or FPO, the shares are available in the stock market for you to purchase, for you to sell, that is in simple terms, trade. Now this company X has decided to purchase back the shares from the market. This in a nutshell is called as share buyback. It is referred to as what? Share buyback. Now, there are two ways through which the share buyback can be done. One, the company X will simply go to the stock market and purchase shares. Simple. Company X will go to the stock market. Imagine, I am the owner of company X. I am the promoter of company X. Although I do not own any companies, just imagine. And you are the shareholder you have let us say 500 shares of my company. In the stock market, I will purchase those shares from you, pay a certain amount of premium. This is basically a process of purchasing or buying back the shares of the company through the stock market. What is the second methodology? It is called as a tender methodology or tendering process. In case of tendering process, all the shareholders are given this information that company is purchasing back or buying back certain number of shares. Simple. All the shareholders are given information. If you want to sell your shares, you can tender. Tender means basically provide. So if you want to sell your shares back to the company, you can tender your shares. This is called as a tender process of buying back. Now, why is the SEBI saying we will do away with the first one and we will promote the second one? In fact, most of the articles have missed this. Please remember this. SEBI says we will phase out the first process that is a share buyback through the stock market. We will phase it out. Whereas, we will promote the share buybacks through the tendering process. Why? Reason is very simple. Imagine, I will take the same example. Imagine you hold 500 shares of my company. I will come to you, I will purchase, again when I say I will come to you, I am talking about the stock market. I will come to you, I will purchase those shares from you, it is basically a share buyback. But is there any guarantee that other shareholders in the market know about this information? In simple terms, whenever share buybacks are done from the stock market, there is no transparency in the process in the sense that other shareholders will never come to know or will not be able to know when the company is trying to purchase back the shares from the stock market. They will simply go to the market, purchase the share and say we have done, we have gone for a share buyback. So the process is not very transparent. Other shareholders will not have the same opportunity as you as a shareholder to sell the shares to the company. Whereas in the tendering process or tender process, the information is given to everyone, all the shareholders. Now, all the shareholders have the right or let us say have the opportunity rather than saying right, have the opportunity to sell the shares to the company in a share buyback. That is the first thing. Second very important thing here is in the tendering process, whenever share buybacks are done, certain percentage of the shares will have to be bought from the small shareholders. That is 15% of the buyback has to be done from the small shareholders only. Whereas such conditions are not applicable whenever share buybacks are done from the stock market. Now many of you will keep on wondering as to, sir, what do you mean by small investors here? Generally the retail investors who invest up to 2 lakh rupees are referred as small investors. So that is also one more reason why SEBI says we will promote share buybacks through tender process not through the stock market purchase. Now, the SEBI has announced that we are going to phase out the first route by March 2025. So, these are certain very important points regarding share buybacks. 
which has been announced by SEBI in recent times. Now, before I go forward, many of you will be thinking, sir, you also told about the third point. That is, you asked us which committee, is there any committee that has recommended phasing out of share buybacks through stock market? That is exactly the question which has been asked here. Which of the following committee has recommended phasing out share buybacks through open market route? That is stock market route. And the right answer for this question is option B, KK Mystery Committee. Please remember this can be asked in UPSC preliminary examination. Next article, World Bank report very recently has stated that since 1970, since 1970, the 2022 will be marking the second worst year in terms of reduction in the poverty. Very recently, World Bank has come out with certain findings. That is, basically in number of charts, they have tried to explain what has happened in the global market in one year, that is in 2022. The name of the report or the name of the paper is simply nine, uh, 2022 in nine charts. And in these nine charts, certain very important observations have been provided. Please remember them. First one, every year certain number of people will enter into poverty and certain number of people will move out of poverty. In simple terms, World Bank says every year because of certain reforms that are undertaken, certain growth that is achieved by the economies, etc., certain number of people move out of extreme poverty. And because of various other issues, certain people might fall into poverty as well. And overall, what has happened to the poverty, extreme poverty numbers, that is actually measured by the World Bank. And as per the latest data published by the World Bank, after 1970, 2022 marks the second worst year in terms of reduction in the poverty. That is in simple terms, whatever poverty reduction has happened post-1970, every year in the global market, 2022 is the worst year after 1970. And as per the World Bank, Roughly around 574 million people will be living in extreme poverty by 2030. Now before going forward, I have one more very important question for you people. Whenever World Bank says extreme poverty, what does World Bank actually mean? I hope you understand my question, I will repeat it again. Whenever World Bank says extreme poverty, please remember that number. And that's your homework by the way. Whenever World Bank says extreme poverty, what does World Bank actually mean there? Right? What is your answer? Give your answer in the comment section below. So by 2030, the number of extremely poor people will be 574 million. And right for 2022, the World Bank same report says that it is 685 million people who are living in extreme poverty. And in many of the cases, it has been found that because of the pandemic, because of the Russia-Ukraine, the war that is taking place, which has led to issues related to energy security, food security, etc. There are certain people who are unable to move out of poverty and certain population has been pushed into poverty. So this is one very important point that has been mentioned in the World Bank report. Second very important point, the debt crisis in the developing countries has actually spiraled or it has actually increased. As per the World Bank report, have a look at this. The debt crisis has intensified in the last one year, especially in the developing countries. The debt crisis has actually intensified. And as per the same report, around 60% of the world poorest country are either in the debt crisis or are moving towards the debt crisis. In simple terms, the debt in these countries has ballooned to such an extent, they are unable to manage the debt, they are unable to generate revenues to repay this debt. So these are certain very, very important numbers or let's say the data that has been provided by the World Bank in its report for the year 2022. Next article is regarding the tariffs. One of the very important articles regarding the tariff, certain data has been provided, we will understand this. What the article simply says is, government of India in recent times 
either has imposed tariffs or is in the process of imposing tariffs. And the issue related to the tariffs is that whenever you talk about a country such as a developing country that is India, if India has to become a developed country, many experts agree that the tariffs have to be either lowered or withdrawn altogether so that the trade between India and rest of the world will be promoted. And this idea of imposing tariff, the reason behind that is very simple. Government of India in multiple ways basically imposes these tariffs either in the tariff barriers right, or in the form of non-tariff barriers in order to protect the domestic market. For example, in recent times, there have been concerns regarding the rising prices of agriculture commodities in the domestic market. The supply of certain commodities such as steel in the domestic market which has led to government of India imposing certain barriers which will reduce the export of commodities. Is it only that on the exports government of India is imposing the barriers? Absolutely no. Even on many of the imports, government of India has kept on imposing barriers. And as per the data that is provided in the article, have a look at this. Between 1991-92, that is a fiscal 92 to fiscal 08, India's peak customs duty on non-agriculture products had actually come down from 150% to 10%, which means to a very great extent, government of India had liberalized the trade between India and rest of the world. But the same article also says that the trend has been reversed now. By 2014, the average tariffs has increased to 13.5% and by 2021, it has further been increased to 18.3%. Which means, government of India has kept on increasing the customs duties on the imports. Now, the concern that the article simply says is that, it's not new that the government is trying out this route of customs duty rise in order to reduce the imports into the domestic market or make it much more costlier. Earlier also, that is even before the LPG reforms of 1991, government of India has actually tried it in the form of self-reliance, in the form of the industry protection, etc., etc. But the concern is that earlier, the situation in the Indian economy is completely different compared to what it is today. For example, sir, what do you mean by this? I will give a very simple example. Earlier in order to protect the companies in India or industries in India, government used to implement policies under the concept or under the framework of infant industry protection. But today, these companies or these industries are not infants, these are not newborns. These are very well established industries. So compared to earlier situation, today's economic scenario is completely different. Then why is the government of India using the same policy that was used earlier in the current situation? That is the question which has been raised by the article here. Right? So these are certain important points regarding the tariff walls which are being implemented by the government. The next article is first bullion boss struggles to shine. Government of India in the last year, that is in 2022, launched or inaugurated IIBX, International Bullion Exchange, IIBX, at Gujarat, that is a gift city. Now basically understand this, the argument of government of India, and theoretically this is a very, very good initiative. The government looked at the consumption of India in terms of gold. India consumes huge amount of a gold and as per various data, India is the second largest consumer of gold in the international market. And as per various estimates, the total demand in India for the gold is 25% of the total demand for the gold in the global market. But despite being such a huge importer, huge consumer, India never had the policy of setting gold prices on India did not have the framework of setting gold prices in India. In simple terms, India was a gold price taker, not a gold price setter. 
and not to address this particular anomaly government of india the in the budget of 2020 announced that they would be setting the first bullion exchange in the indian market and following that announcement last year government of india actually inaugurated international bullion exchange iibx wherein the gold importers basically the exchange the the importers of the gold registered of course meeting certain conditions were allowed to import gold and pay for it and because this was done in an exchange we expected that there will be a huge number as well as the value of the gold that is transacted and that tra there will be a transparency in the process of importing the gold and deciding the price of the gold at what price it has to be sold in the domestic market with this objective IIBX was launched by the government in the IFSE International Financial Services Center which is located in the gift city that is Gujarat International Finance Tech City gift city. Now what is the data? Should you remember the data? Absolutely no. Don't worry about the data here. As per the latest data that is given in the newspaper article here, very small amount of a gold has been actually traded in this box. That is, which the IABX which was launched on July 29th till 16th December, the total trade volume which has been reported is just 532 kgs, averaging around 6.5 kgs on day to day basis. Which means India importing so much amount of a gold, the preferred route is not this exchange, rather, the traditional route of import has continued. The reason has been provided in the same article. The reason they say is the, the concept was very good but the marketing was not done properly. That is the concept of IIBX was not appropriately marketed to the international community as well as the community within the domestic market that is in simple terms all the stakeholders were not basically favoring the IIBX because of lower marketing actions and as a result of this the article says that the number of authorized dealers who are actually preferring this route for importing gold is no or is there, there are no authorized dealers who are preferring this route for importing gold into India and that is the precise reason it says this initiative government of India no doubt is a very good initiative but it has failed to take off or it has failed to launch as per the expectations of the government. So this is regarding IIBX. Based on this, I have given a question here. Consider the following regarding IIBX. It is a bullion derivative market. Technical statement, but the statement one is wrong. Why? It is not a derivative market. It is a spot market. Now many of you ask me sir what is this idea of a spot market and a derivative market simple whenever you talk about the spot market you buy and sell in the same instance that is for example if I purchase a share I will make the payment I will purchase the share in fact we have shifted to a concept of T plus 1 settlement system. Now do not worry about settlement here concept is simple the shares are bought and sold commodities are bought and sold the payment as well as the transfer of the assets happen at the same instance that is called as a spot market whereas when you talk about derivative markets such as futures you do not buy and sell on the same day although you are entering into a, a agreement today the sale will take place on a future date I hope you understand for example if I am purchasing certain commodity from you under the derivative market the agreement is signed today but the sale actually will conclude the sale transaction will actually happen on a future date. So the IIBX is a spot market not a derivative market. SEBI will be the regulator of IIBX again second statement is also wrong. It is the IFSC authority which is the regulator of IIBX. Both the statements are wrong right option for this question will be option D neither 1 nor 2. Let me go to the next article here. Exports to UAE have surged 
after India has implemented or signed and implemented free trade agreement. Now, some of you will be looking at this article and saying, sir, why, why have you picked up this article? We have read in the article that India-Australia trade agreement also has taken off from 29th of December, of course. But why specifically this article you have picked up? The reason is very simple. India has not signed any agreements between 2011 or after 2011. After a 10 year hiatus or after a, a decade of running away or shying away from signing any of the free trade agreement, government of India signed the free trade agreement with UAE which has come into force from 2022. Simple, it has come into force from 2022. And right understand this, once this particular FT has come into force in the month of May 2022, what has happened regarding the imports from UAE as well as exports to UAE? The article basically gives you data. Before going forward, here is a very important point. Should you conclude whether the FTA is successful or not successful based on one article or based on this data? Answer is absolutely no. Please remember this. Why? Please understand this is one FTA. First and foremost, this is one FTA. India has signed multiple FTAs, is in negotiation with many other countries to sign FTAs. Second, from May the, to the December, the data is provided in the article. That is a very short time period to come to a conclusion whether the FTA is successful or not. Whether it is going to provide benefits to India or not, it is a very, very short window to come to a conclusion. Then why are we discussing the article? Simple. The author of the article simply says that the trade data that we are able to look at because of this agreement, this is very much encouraging for India. In terms of trade, the data is very much encouraging. What do you mean by this? Simple. Have a look at this. Exports to UAE have increased by 13.5%. And if you compare this particular exports, which have increased by 13.5%, this is a much higher growth in the exports when compared to the overall exports that have happened from India to rest of the world. That is from May to December, the overall exports, just make a correction, May to October, the overall exports have increased by only 10%. Compared to this, the exports from India to UAE have increased by 13.5%. Apart from this, other data, how much billion worth or million worth of trade is being done, all that data is provided, do not buy heart it, UPC will not ask you. So, this is first point. Second point, the imports also have increased. Imports during this period, overall imports have increased by 34.6%. But compared to this, imports from UAE have increased by only 32%. In simple terms, if you look at the trade data, the growth in the export trade is much more encouraging compared to right, the overall growth rate. And that is the precise reason the article says that though, though the growth rate in case of imports is higher, again, I'm looking at only the percentage number here. The trade because of the exports which have gone up or risen from India to UAE, the trade data is very much encouraging. And please remember this, during this particular period, the overall exports from India have taken a hit. I hope you understand this. In the last year, for many, many months or for large number of months in the last year, the exports from India to the global market have taken a hit. In that scenario, India's exports to UAE have actually increased by a larger percentage which is encouraging. So, this information is provided, please have a look at it. Apart from this, please do not buy hard the numbers, the numbers are not relevant, UPSC will not ask you the numbers, even if they ask you by the time you write the exam, the numbers would be different. Next, China has started WTO dispute against USA. Now, what is this idea? Simple. USA as a retaliatory measure, because please understand, China and USA have been involved in multiple initiatives now, where one country is trying to basically subdue the growth in the other country or 
basically trying to use a particular a certain policy to overtake the other country right it all started many many years ago and which which led to a trade war and it has basically continued and one of the policies or let's say there were multiple policies which are used by usa in the last year that is in 2022 and even before that which have basically restricted the growth or let's say the flow of the semiconductor conductors which are very very necessary in the chinese market for example us has introduced the chips act under which they want semiconductor manufacturers to come to usa manufacture in usa not to get certain amount of assistance or the subsidies from the government they have also amended their custom policies or export policies wherein they are trying to restrict the flow of the semiconductors to china either directly manufactured from usa to china or even using the technology of usa or equipments which are manufactured by usa purchased by other countries now there are restrictions to export those semiconductors to china in simple terms either directly or indirectly the flow of the semiconductors to china is trying to be restricted usa is trying to restrict it this is one type of basically a policy that has been adopted by usa against this policy china has approached wto world trade organization and has raised a dispute against such policy generally whenever such disputes are brought to the wto under the wto there is a mechanism for resolving such disputes the first stage generally to resolve such disputes is through negotiations or through basically right the consultations between two countries or mediation between two countries which will come to certain agreement if both of these countries do not come to any agreement during let's say negotiations or let's say the mediation etc then there is no other option but by the dispute settlement body to appoint a panel to look into the dispute and give a report to the the dispute settlement body right so these are certain very important points regarding the wto dispute that has been brought up by china against usa regarding its policy next article only one fourth of the sanctioned solar projects have taken off statement has been given by the minister now what is this idea the government of india has been promoting the idea for renewable energy and one type of renewable energy which has been the focus of various policies of government of india is to promote solar energy production in india and in order to achieve that government of india has launched a new initiative or a scheme scheme for development of solar parks and ultra mega power projects under which so far 57 solar parks have been approved by the government and if you take the potential that is once these 57 solar parks would be established how much of solar energy that could be produced comes to be 39285 megawatts but as per the latest data that has been given by the government itself though 57 solar parks have been approved aggregating to more than 39000 megawatt of solar energy only around 1/4 of this that is the projects which will amount to 1/4 of this solar energy production have been operationalized that is again you can make a note of this the solar power projects amounting to 10027 megawatt have been commissioned so far in the last year the reason as per the statement that was given by the minister the reason is one as usual any issue related to infrastructure please mention this particular point land acquisition has become very very difficult land acquisition is very very difficult right that is one and many of you will look at this and say sir why why land acquisition is so difficult the reason is very simple here it is very difficult to get land with clear titles or clean titles now many of you will simply ask me now second question sir what do you mean by clean titles simple i will show a piece of paper that is a bond paper to you which says that i am the owner of the land i will sell the land to you i will collect the money from you now after the transaction is settled 
now as per the new bond paper you are the owner of the land somebody else will approach you and say that no the person who sold the land to you he was not the actual owner i am the owner now and because you have not purchased from me you are not the owner you have been duped you have been basically cheated upon by someone else so the argument is clean titles very difficult to get land with clean titles in india so that is one issue land acquisition is basically a problem and you can mention this wherever wherever you are writing an article or you are writing an answer regarding infrastructure development problem or hurdles in india i'll give a very simple example one of the issues one of the issues why we are yet to see operationalization of bullet train in india is acquisition of the land many other projects have been stuck or have been basically discontinued by state government central government etc because of the issue of land acquisition second important point why there is a delay in development of these particular projects is environmental issues environmental issues sir any example of environmental issues here in fact the minister himself has provided the information regarding that the article says that many of these solar developers have acquired land in the area which is generally associated with protection or conservation of gib great indian bustard right that is a environmental angle associated with development or let's say the delay or the non development of these solar projects and the third issue that has been flagged by the ministry is there's a mismatch between the time taken developed time taken to develop the solar projects and the time taken to set up infrastructure to route the produced energy to grid what do you mean by this simple imagine here is a solar power plant this energy that is generated here has to be supplied to you has to be supplied to me do you think this company which is generating solar energy will supply electricity to us no this has to be supplied to a network which is called as a, a grid then it will be supplied to discom then it will be supplied to you or me now what if this grid infrastructure the delay there is a delay in development of this compared to the development of this project itself if there is a mismatch in the completion of this infrastructure project and this infrastructure project that is let us say the solar project is developed but the grid connection is not yet provided it simply means or there is a mismatch means generally there is a delay in development of all of these projects so these are some of the very important points which have been mentioned by the government which is delaying the implementation of these solar power projects next article government could tap into nssf for extra funds what is the article all about government of india very recently has informed or has sought the permission of the parliament to borrow more amount in order to incur certain expenditure under the current financial year budget how much you don't have to be worried please don't buy at the data upsc doesn't ask it but what the article simply says is despite government of india proposing to borrow or proposing to basically spend 3.26 trillion rupees extra now that is compared to the budget estimates the amount of a borrowing will not be higher for the government that is in simple terms government has proposed to spend more money but the borrowings of the government market borrowings would not increase some of will be confused that is some of will simply say sir if government wants to spend extra money the borrowing should increase why is that the government is proposing to spend extra money 3.2 trillion rupees extra but their borrowings are not increasing it doesn't make any sense to me please be very careful can the government spend more money without borrowing more from the market answer is yes by the way sir how how is that possible what if i were to say that the amount of tax receipts collected by the government have increased first point possible if the amount collected by the government tax receipts collected by the government increases 
government's borrowing may not change but the expenditure done by the government might increase possible of course yes this is point number one second point rather than borrowing from the market that is issuing the bonds and borrowing from the market what if government borrows from nssf that is national small savings fund what if they tap into nssf and that is basically a part of the public account and use the money for incurring expenditure possible of course yes because please understand by tapping into nssf government is not issuing bonds in the market so can government of india take the funds from the nssf incur it as an expenditure without increasing or without issuing any bonds in the market of course the answer is yes third one what if i were to say that government is able to save certain amount of subsidy expenditure that is another type of revenue expenditure government is going to save certain amount of subsidy expenditure and as a result of this the expenditure will increase without government having to borrow additional funds from the market so these are the three very important reasons why the article says that government is increasing the expenditure but without please understand without having to borrow any more from the market right so please be very very careful these kind of analytical statements can be asked by upsc second important point which is provided here is the amount of the amount of central government spending which has been proposed for the current financial year budget that is budget expenditure or budget estimates for overall expenditure is 39.4 trillion and this will be higher by 2.5 to 3 trillion rupees now how much will be the exact amount of expenditure you will not be able to know right even after the announcement of the budget now some of you will be looking at this statement or hearing this statement and say sir but in the budget that is let's say upcoming budget government will tell me what is the expenditure for the last financial year but please be very very careful here this is a very tricky statement that is i'm saying that let's say for the financial year 24 that is 23 and 24 the government will announce a budget on the 1st of february will you come to know how much is the actual expenditure incurred in the previous financial year that is financial year 23 will you be able to come to know answer is simply no why simple reason is financial year 23 will end on the march that is the 31st march of 2023 but the budget announcement is done on the 1st of february 2023 so until unless the financial year is over how will you come to know how much is the total expenditure or actual expenditure incurred by the government in the financial year 23 so when will you come to know the actual expenditure incurred by the government in the financial year 23 you will come to know the information when the government will announce the budget for the financial year 25 that is next year not this year next year so these are certain important points apart from this fiscal deficit target the government says they are confident of, confident of achieving the fiscal deficit which was target in the budget at 6.4 percent they will be able to achieve that etc so these are certain very important points regarding government tapping into nssf for additional funding next regarding nps funds the government of india has clarified and even pfrd has clarified that there is no law which allows the refund of NPS funds to states. Now, what is this argument? There are many states, although center has clarified it does not have any intention to do that. There are many states which have discontinued or have announced discontinuation of new pension scheme and have decided go, to go back to old pension scheme. Simple. There are many state governments which have announced that they will not be continuing with the new pension scheme and they will be reverting back to old pension scheme. Now many of you simply ask me sir what is this basic idea of NPS and OPS? Simple. Imagine there is a government employee. Government employee during the period of the work that is whenever they are working 
part of the monthly salary they will contribute which will be, which will be used as fund and after the retirement they will be provided with pension. So there is a contribution and the government employee will get the pension after the retirement. That is basically the concept of new pension scheme that is contribution based pension scheme. Whereas uh, earlier before the introduction of NPS there was a concept of old pension scheme where the government employees or the employees did not contribute but they would get certain amount of pension after the retirement. So there is no contribution but they will get certain amount after the retirement. That is basically the old pension scheme. Now many of the state governments have announced that they have introduced a new pension scheme earlier they have introduced it but they will discontinue it and they will revert back to old pension scheme. And under the NPS whatever contribution was done that is basically from the salary whatever contribution was taken away it was basically given to PFRDA in simple terms because under the PFRDA all these pension funds are run. So it was given to PFRDA now the states have written a letter to PFRDA saying that whatever contribution has been done by the employees under the NPS that is a new pension scheme please give it back to us and we will use it to launch old pension scheme. To this central government that is the finance ministry has categorically said there is no rule which allows transfer of such funds. In addition to this the chairman of PFRDA has written a letter to all the states which have requested such transfers saying that there is no rule which under which PFRDA is allowed to transfer such funds back to the states. So this is the clarification that has been provided right by the finance ministry as well as the chairman of the PFRDA regarding the transfer of funds back to the states from the NPS. Next article regarding CBDC central board digital currency that is e-rupee. Earlier the e-rupee was launched in the wholesale segment that is a wholesale e-rupee was launched and later Reserve Bank of India launched the retail e-rupee for pilot how the e-rupee will function on pilot basis that is a retail e-rupee. One of the specific features that was announced by Reserve Bank of India was that whenever e-rupee will be used for conducting transactions it will be anonymous. That is in simple terms if I transfer e-rupee to you or if you use the e-rupee to conduct certain transactions to purchase goods in the market there is no paper trail there is no trail for these particular transactions others will not be able to find out. That was one of the attractive features of that is anonymity feature of e-rupee. But very recently with the launch of the pilot project of retail e-rupee it has been found that though the project was said to be or the CBDC was stated to be anonymous that is the transactions would be anonymous there is a lot of trail that is getting created whenever such transactions are conducted. Many of you ask me sir how? How is that anonymity is under doubt or under the cloud here? Simple. Imagine I have certain e rupees. I will transfer the e rupees, some of them, to you. Or I will purchase certain goods. I will make the payment of e rupees. Now, whenever such transactions are conducted, messages are sent to the one who is receiving the e rupees as well as messages are sent to the one who is sending e rupee or who has sent e rupee. Now whenever these messages are sent it simply means there is a data there is a data point which basically is creating nothing but a trail of these transactions which means bank knows how much e rupee has been transferred that is available in the messages. This has raised a certain concerns over anonymity nature or anonymity feature of e rupees and uh, this basically has has been one of the issues which is faced by RBI which is plaguing the implementation of CBDC retail version 
that is e rupee retail version of reserve bank of india now regarding this as of now as of even today rbi has not given any clarity going forward i'm pretty sure there will be certain measure or let's say certain policy of reserve bank of india regarding whether e rupee is truly anonymous or there will be a trail that is created whenever e rupee transactions are conducted so these are certain very important points regarding the anonymous anonymous feature related to cbdc retail rupees so these are the various articles as well as the questions related to these articles which have appeared between 10th of december to 23rd of december 2022 if you like this initiative hit the like button and as already mentioned in this new year we are going to come out with large number of or let's say new initiatives to provide lot of benefits to the upsc aspirants or the civil services aspirants to avail all of these benefits all you need to do is simply two things one join the telegram channel of byju's exam prep ias and second subscribe to byju's exam prep ias youtube channel and hit the bell icon so that's it from my side for this week next week see you again live monday at 8 pm thank you have a great day